Well, good morning and happy Kannada Rajyotsava Day. Yeah. For me, it's a pleasure that it's a holiday because I could have this event. I was here in Bangalore for something else and otherwise I would have had to make a special trip. But it's an even greater pleasure to be in BIC after, I don't know, six years or something because COVID and retirement together conspired to reduce the amount of normal travel. And I did launch a book in BIC, but that was several moons ago. Thank you for taking the time off and spending a valuable time. I've got dear friends like Pranab Barua, who have done the supreme sacrifice, like Ahilya Bai Holkar. He's given up golf this morning to come and <laughs> attend this function. I mean, as a fellow golfer, I entirely understand the level of sacrifice involved. Uh, I want to speak for maybe 20, 25 minutes because it's unfair to expect that all of you would be, have read my book. But I've got a, letter, a title at least that would arouse curiosity. Why do flies, clubs and companies go around in circles? So let me start with that because the start combines I pass off as a researcher nowadays, now that I've retired from the corporate world. It combines my research and writing uh, and gives the sort of foreground, the backstory for what I want to talk about the book. I have always wondered, you know, I live in Mumbai and every monsoon, the flies come in. And they're very irritating. Uh, unlike uh, mosquitoes which at least bite you to remind them that they're around. These flies just go around and they sit on your hand when you pick up your cup of coffee, so the cup of coffee spills. You have a number of issues that come with that. So why do flies go around in circles? Weren't they taught Newtonian physics so that they know the shortest point from point A to point B is a straight line? All human beings, as you know, go in a straight line from point A to point B, except when they are running clubs and associations and companies or governments. But when they are running clubs and companies and governments, human beings also go around and round in circles. If you question my statement, try becoming chairman of a cooperative society. <laughs> or even a club, Bangalore club, <laughs> Delhi Gymkhana. And it's unbelievable that a cooperative society is a unique construct of an assembly of uncooperative people being brought together by law. <laughs> I don't know how perfectly normal people start behaving abnormally and we've all had that experience. So for me, the truth of this phenomenon lay in why the fly goes round in circles. And here's what I found. Those of you who are anatomists or interested in nature might know this, but I would assume that the large number of you don't know. See, we humans have two eyes. And in physiological terms, they are called simple eyes. A simple eye means they move together in tandem, but uh, they can move up, down, left, right, anywhere, and I can move my neck. So I don't have 360 degree vision, but if I smell a pot of honey there, I can do that, and I can perambulate towards that side. A fly can't do that. That little fly that bothers you in the morning has 4,000 eyes. 2,000 on this side, 2000 on that side. Just for fun, go back and Google the eye of the fly and you'll find it's a horrendous picture because it's like a shish mahal. Each eye is fixed. So it's not a simple eye, it's called a compound eye. It's like a glass piece. Now imagine you have 2000 glass pieces here, 2000 here and each one is looking in its own direction. So I can have backward 360 degree vision, but the trouble is very blurred because I see everything in one go. So if I'm seeing Mr. Jairaj, this eye is seeing Jairaj, but all the other 3,900 eyes are looking somewhere else. If I want to move towards Jairaj, then I have to move my whole body, I have to adapt my body. So the perambulation is not in a straight line, but like a plane arrives in Bombay airport, goes around in circles, and that eye is fixed on him. And that is always in an equilateral triangle with my path of motion. And that's why a fly goes around in circles. 
And what associations, clubs, companies have is this. They don't have simple eyes. They have compound eyes. Everybody has an opinion. It's a democracy. And everybody can express his opinion. So how the building society should run, whether the children should be allowed to play in the playground, whether the water supply should be from 9 to 11 or 10 to 12, will produce that many views. And the only way for the society, when I use the word club or society, read companies, read uh, governments, read international relations, all the same. The only way to respond is to do what the fly does. Adapt your body. Because the eye cannot be changed. And that's the connection between the fly, the club, companies. I would have added governments, but I was scared nowadays you don't say government and sleep comfortably, so I kept quiet. Now, why is this important? Because I was, this is the backstory. By the way, just a little aside, just for uh, not take the morning too seriously. When I stumbled on this, that I said, how do you stop the fly from coming in? And my friend told me, take a plastic bag, transparent plastic bag, you know, this type of bag. Fill it up with water and tie it up at the neck. So you have a balloon of water, hang it in the window and the flies won't come. And if you put two or three bags, you're completely insulated. So I said, this is the biggest load of rubbish I've heard. This must be some ancient rishi who said this. But my Bihari cook, not being that well endowed with so-called IQ, said, Saab, kehte hain to karke dekhiye na, kya harz hai. So I invested my meager pension in buying plastic bags. <laughs> tied it around the window and the fly stopped coming. And that's what caused me to inquire, why did the fly stop coming? And then I realized when the fly comes close to that bag, it sees its image in a concave lens. Stand in front of a car, you look so big and fat that you'll be scared to look at the car, you'll go away. Have you ever seen anybody beautifying his hair standing in front of a car? And the fly runs away. So that is the secret. The concavity of this balloon causes the fly to look so big, he gets scared and he goes away. Now, you know, I'm a physics honor, IIT, you know, I had to show that I'm a scientifically minded guy. <laughs> so I called my Bihari chap and said, Lagan bhai, abhi humko pata lag gaya ki kyon andar ne aata hai makhi. I explained my Newtonian physics to him. He said, Sahi baat keh rahe aap. Hum kal ja ke pachas bag lena chate hai. I said, kyo? He said, abhi toh humko gaon jana hai next week. Wahan pe bhoot makhi hai sab. Iska bazaar bhoot bada hai, tez hai. And I'm going to sell everybody a bag which I bought here for two rupees, for thirty rupees. Or mene aane jane ka kharcha bhi pura ho jai ga usme. This is the entrepreneurial instinct. He sees a business opportunity out of that explanation. And this is what marketers, not quite so facile as I've made it out, but uh, they look for gaps uh, in the market and they try to fulfill it. So let me now come to the subject of the board itself, having given you the preamble. I have served on boards for a long time. I think I'm finishing my 37th anniversary since I joined the first board. And it must be about 25 companies, 30 companies, listed, unlisted, in India, in Sri Lanka, in the Middle East, in England. And I found that boards also tend to don't follow all the SEBI rules. SEBI keeps on putting more and more rules. The more they put out, the less they are followed. So I was curious about this. And then an astronomical an observation from astronomy caught my fancy when Chandrayaan-3 was happening. Well, somewhat before that. Did, do you realize you're always seeing the same face of the moon? The moon is going around the earth and it keeps turning its face. So it's like a beautiful girl. If you remember Satyam Shivam Sundaram, he's always seeing Zina Taman's pretty, face, pretty side of her face, but not the scarred side of her face. That's to do with the geometry of how the moon goes around the earth. But 
इट इज ऑलवेज बिन अ क्यूरियोसिटी फॉर ह्यूमन बींग्स टू से पर्दे के पीछे क्या है इट्स इवन फाउंड अ बॉलीवुड सॉन्ग बट दैट वॉज चोली के पीछे क्या है क्यूरियोसिटी इज एग्जैक्टली द सेम सो आई से बोर्ड के पीछे क्या है वेन वी थिंक ऑफ अ बोर्ड वी थिंक ऑफ पीपल हु आर वेल एजुकेटेड सूटेड बूटेड परहैप्स फॉर्मल स्पीकिंग गुड इंग्लिश फॉलोइंग रूल्स एंड रेगुलेशंस एंड वर्किंग रैशनली बट द रियलिटी इज नॉट क्वाइट दैट ऑर्डरली बिकॉज देर इज एन अनदर एस्पेक्ट विच इज नेवर डिस्कस्ड इन द पब्लिक डोमेन विच इज द बिहेवियर ऑफ पीपल बिकॉज बोर्ड्स आर कंप्राइज ऑफ ह्यूमन बींग्स लाइक यू एंड मी एंड वी आर नॉट पैरागन्स ऑफ रैशनैलिटी दो वी प्रिटेंड टू बी God has created 7.89 million species of this planet since its inception. One of the favors I'm going to do you is to give you statistics which you have no way of verifying. <laughs> That's also a skillful art, you know. But there have been reportedly 7.89 million species. No other species out of 7.888888 pretends to be rational. All of them say I'm instinctive. so if you go to a dog and raise your hand he will recoil human beings pretend to be rational but they actually act instinctively and that's why there are no board of directors in the fly kingdom or in the panther kingdom or in the canine kingdom it's only among human beings that you have boards managing committees executive committee etc and the be behavior of people when they come to the board when i use the word board and company please don't think of large public listed companies only think of managing committee of your business unit your startup your club whatever you want uh they are actually responding rationally and one of the great mysteries to me is i've asked many people this before i wrote a book on this uh why do people think they are rational when you point out to them that the life's most important decisions have been taken without rationality but they pretend to be rational they say oh, how can you say that i said well who did you marry please tell me what rational technique you used did you give her a rating 3.88 is better than 3.86 and marry that girl boy you're dead if you done that you ultimately went by your instinct you do a merger and acquisition of course you do valuations you get and if you name the number of merchant bankers you get that many valuations all of them equally plausible at the end of the day you say yaar i want to do this let's do it intuition is not a substitute for rationality it what finalizes the last mile of rationality and we lead our lives that way how to raise your children nobody is trained in that Imagine if you met a mother who said I'm a PhD in child rearing I can advise you how to raise your child you'll run in the opposite direction because the woman's instinct works when she's raising a child or a man so having said this why do you expect directors who are sitting around a table to be so rational that they'll have deep knowledge of accountancy valuations mergers and acquisitions taxation information technology artificial intelligence apart from the business of the company which is to sell trucks or soaps or whatever so they also behave uh, with uh, and the governance is determined by their behavior and the behavior is determined by their culture and how they have been raised to think for example in indian boards we tend to be deferential to the chairman that is related i suppose to the way we are brought up badon ki izzat karo I have seen a Dutch board <laughs> where a 28-year-old fellow will tell a 50-year-old chairman, "Oh, Hans, I don't agree with that." Firstly, he'll call him Hans, which is very rare here, and he says, "I don't agree with that." And why don't I agree with it? He'll go back and forth, and some solution will be found. Uh, whatever we may say about women and diversity, if that lone poor woman comes to the boardroom, the male carnivorous characters around the table will through behavior uh, make her feel alone howsoever smart she may be conversely she has the pressure 
that she has to show she's she's smart. She's not there because of clause 22 in the SEBI rule. So she is very aggressive. She wants to show that she's contributing. Or the reverse can happen. She may withdraw completely. People sort out matters outside the boardroom so that a decision has been sort of pre-made. And then they come into the boardroom and say, ah, what do you think? Ah, it's okay. Fine, go ahead. I know one company where the chairman happened to be the promoter family. He called the chairman of the nominations and remuneration committee just prior to a meeting on how the profit sharing should happen of, for the commission to the directors. And he said, uh, listen, the mathematics shows that we are entitled to give the two and a half crores. We are five directors. Just thought I'll give you a guideline. Leave two crores for me and the balance 50 lakhs. <laughs> and that guy carried it out. On what ground? That he's the promoter. I think the word promoter is a dead duck. We are the only country in the whole world which has this concept of a promoter. Nowhere else in the world do people talk of promoters. You may be a founder. You may be a majority shareholder. But there's nothing called a promoter. So the concept of a promoter in India has come due to the hangover of the managing agency system. Because the bank wants to know who to catch, whose name to put on the front page of the newspaper. Provided it starts with A and ends with I, they are happy to put his phone, <laughs> photograph on the front page. But this is ridiculous. Here's a company where his family owns 35%. 65% is owned by somebody else. You go after him both journalistically and legally and so on and so forth. Maybe that's a good thing to do to fix a guy who's a crook. But not every businessman is a crook, believe it or not. I know many NGOs think all businessmen are crooks. And I say very politely to them, you're probably right, but there are as many crooks in, amongst the NGOs as a percentage because that's the nature of human behavior. So in inside the boardroom, I'm not going to go chapter by chapter because I just want to give you an overview and I'm waiting for interrogation by the enforcement directorate shortly. <laughs> uh, we have covered what are the kind of biases we suffer from. There are probably a hundred. But my co-author being an academic, she has made a little table with five or six which are most important. I've alluded to them just now uh, while speaking of the biases. The Second thing we did in this book, and I'm pointing these out because I think these are a little distinctive in the corporate governance uh, narratives that are going around. Uh, the second thing we did is, are you supposed to respond when you see danger signals or after the danger has hit you? So often we find that all the signal was available, but people did nothing about it. Almost that they were asleep. And then you'll find a newspaper headline which says, independent director sleeping at the wheel. I have had that experience. I'm not proud of this track record, but I've been involved with the parting of ways, that's a polite way of saying firing, uh, number of CEOs. I just about escaped being fired myself, I'm sure, from time to time. But what are the signals you get? And can you operate on signals? And we can talk about it if the subject is relevant. But we have devised a questionnaire, which appears in the book, of 15 questions. Like a reader's digest, it pays to increase your word power. You put a tick and you get a one or a zero. And we have said, if you get 10 to 15, watch out you're in the wrong company. If you get something, three to 10, try it five to 10, uh, try to correct a few things. If it's less than five, You'll never find a perfect company like there's no perfect human being. Learn to live with it. And I think that's a bit distinctive because I, my only claim to rigor is that I've tried it out, not only on several boards where I've served, but I've also tried it out on various public bodies. Because at the end of the day, this court of public opinion is more important than the court of law, with due respects to our chief justice and company. The court of public opinion is very important. Did people of a particular party get involved in the killing of Mahatma Gandhi, oh boy, you can get all the books written. It will always linger in your mind. Did what happened in a particular state in communal riots, who was behind it? You can always have books in analysis, but you will always have a feeling it was to do with A or B. And so on and so forth. So 
if the court of public opinion is influencing people, and let's not deny that it does, then you should need advance signals. If you're a parent raising your child, and your daughter or son at the age of 12 or 14 is suddenly showing unusual behavior, coming home late, not sleeping well at night, on the cell phone, through the night, a bit unfocused on studies. As a parent, those are signals, it's not proof. Would you do something about it? You would. You try to find out more. You may do it right or wrong. And I think directors must also do that. And so in another part of the book, we have given what we've called the 7D step. That if you're a director of a company, don't take it lightly. It sounds like a very prestigious thing to be able to say, I'm a director of XYZ company. Here are the seven Ds. D, each D stands for a step. From the time you detect something till the time you depart. And how to go about thinking of these. So that's the second uh, thing as a distinctiveness I would point out. And the last thing I would do is to point out an idea that we put in the epilogue of the book, which we call the idea of a fly on the wall. Human beings behave the way they do without knowing that the effect they're having on other people is in a particular way. If you don't believe me, go and ask your spouse. <laughs> You'll immediately get the feedback. You don't know how arrogant you sound or how super intelligent you sound or how um, rough your words are, right? And if somebody says, you never had such a conversation with your spouse, then I'll say he's a wonderful spouse he's found or he's wonderfully dishonest, whichever you want to choose. I have certainly had the experience. In the old days when you had to go to the telephone, the telephone wasn't coming to you, I'd pick up the phone and some matter of business would be going on, I would say something and my wife would say, I don't know who you're talking to, I don't know what the matter was, but why were you so rude to him? I wasn't rude to him, how, how dare you interfere in my office matters? <laughs> and then like our television debate, it went off in a different direction. And we never resolved the issue of whether I was rude or not. But by God, I cannot deny I must have been rude a few times. Show me a man who can put his hand on his heart and say he was never rude to anybody. So, we have provided what is called a fly on the wall idea. I have operated as a fly on the wall in two companies whose names would understandably be uh, not mentioned. I was invited by the chairman of the board to come and sit in, not to participate in, <coughs> in the board. <coughs> At the end, he didn't ask me, does that acquisition sound good to you? He said, how are people behaving? And. Uh, I'm not going into the detail of the engagement, but I'm glad to say that I seem to have had at least not a negative effect on the board. In a private moment, I feel happy that I had a positive effect. And I do believe that getting somebody else to watch the proceedings without getting involved allows you to get a commentary on behavior, just like Winston Churchill's wife, Clementine, did it for him. And if any of you ever go to London, go to the Imperial War Museum, which is next to Regent's Park, the uh, underground. There's a beautiful letter there. And it's torn and then cello-taped. And that made me very intrigued. What is this letter? It's written in hand with a fountain pen. Go back to the 1930s, 40s. My darling Willie, uh, Winnie. And the essence of the thing was, the country is going through a very tough time. Your leadership is extremely important. But of late, I've had some of your senior colleagues come and tell me that you're irascible and unsufferable. <laughs> Darling Vinnie, you know I love you so much. Do think about the matter and do something about it. With ever so much love, Clementine. Then I said, why is it torn? So she wrote it. And when Winston Churchill came back in a highly sober condition at one o'clock in the morning, <laughs> she said, I can't kill him by giving him this letter. So she tore it up. And some woman who was cleaning the room the next morning picked it up, gave it back, cello taped it to the museum. That's the fly on the wall we need. Thank you very much for listening to me so patiently. I'm not sure whether I've... What happens next? 
good morning to all our esteemed members of BIC and pleasure to welcome you to Bangalore Gopal. Uh, for many of us, you are uh, a resident of Bangalore in more senses than one. And we remember on this occasion your uh, association with Bangalore, intimate association in the 90s when Gita and you ran a beautiful home in uh, Brookfield. Brookfields. And I remember you very vividly in the 24th National Management Convention that you co-chaired with Narayan Murthy, in which we had the distinction of getting uh, C.K. Prahla to deliver the keynote and also to, um, to conduct a unique forum for leaders, which you chaired. So, warm welcome to you. I have read your book from cover to cover, Gopal, I must tell you, and I am very impressed with the way your 18th book has come out. Because an arcane and dry subject like corporate governance, you have converted it into something extremely topical and pointed. And I say this because this morning there is a news report, some of you may have read it, that one of the accounting majors in India is now going to devise what they call a loyalty and trust index of 1,000 companies. And they have several parameters that they are going to research and analyze. And on that basis, they are going to rank companies confidentially on the basis of this trust index. And the trust index follows all the behavioral norms that you have mentioned in your book. And the importance of this trust index is apparently in the West, such a trust index has been devised and it has increased market capitalization of the companies that are trusted by the regulators, by the public, by the stakeholders, by the shareholders, by more than 30 to 40%. And it also enhances the staying of employees. It reduces the attrition rate. So that is why this is a very topical and useful subject. Uh, Gopal, I have a few questions to ask you, not in an interrogatory style, but more in the, uh, to draw out some of the themes that you have mentioned. And I would like to place them before you and post that. We have an excellent audience here and I'm sure they have many questions to ask you. My first question, Gopal, is about the, what you say the failure of corporate governance is because behavioral factors are bypassed. <clears throat> And the emphasis is mostly on process and laws alone. In fact, you have put it very well. You say that niyam is what is being emphasized rather than niti and niyat. Would you like to elaborate that a little bit? So, um, it's fashionable nowadays, and I have fallen to that fashion, to quote some old Sanskrit thing, to... <laughs> add uh, weight to the particular argument that you're giving. And uh, I've chosen this 3N formula. After writing the book, I've added a fourth N. So I'll give you the full thing. Um, all of corporate governance is about niyam. For those who are not following Sanskrit, there are one or two foreign faces. Niyam are rules and procedures. Okay? But the niyat that is the strategic intent or corporate purpose of the person is also of very great relevance. If I am an entrepreneur, a startup founder, and I say within five years I want to raise a valuation to five billion, become a unicorn or a sunicorn or whatever corny stuff uh, uh, people try to get to, and I am going to back out by selling X percent of my equity and buy a new house in Koramangala. Sorry, I <laughs> Koramangala is incidental, don't get me wrong. <laughs> for those who are from Koramangla, uh, no, no offense meant. <clears throat> then I do my, run my company in a particular way. If I am a Godrej or a Tata or a William Heskett Lever, I say, I want to run a company, it will be there after 200 years. What do I have to do to fix it now? There are tiger mothers who raise their daughters or sons, they must get into Harvard somehow or the other. And they 
put them into the right schools. Nothing wrong with one or the other. Right? I'm just saying you must know the niyat. The other moms who say, let the child grow up naturally. Of course, you must get her to get good marks and so on and so forth. If not Harvard, it's okay. MIT will also do. <laughs> you know, it depends on what sort of view you take on it. <clears throat> and therefore, that is niyat. Uh, niyam or rules. Niti is conduct. How do you behave day to day? And if I once, uh, I'm taking a rather dramatic example, but in the interest of time, I'm taking it. I don't want to make a generalization out of it. I was once invited to a debate in Calcutta, which is my home city. I was born and raised there. And the subject was something like professional managers, entrepreneurship, some such thing. And the guy on the other side made the following statement. I am chairman of so-and-so company. It is my family company. And I'm running this company because I know that I must get my son to succeed me. I don't believe in all these professional managers. Get them to do the work that you instruct them to do. I found that a bit offensive, personally. But I decided not to show my offense. But I said, I beg to differ with you, sir. It's not your company. He said, nobody's ever told me this before. I said, I'm telling you, you own 46% of the equity. Even if you own 66%, it's not yours. The moment you're less than 100, somebody else has got a stake in that. And even if you're 100, the community has a stake in it. You can't do whatever you feel like. Anyway, we had a point of contention. The debate went on. But this is what I mean by Niti. So chairman will walk into a room saying, I'm the chairman, I'm the last word on it, rather than I'm the chief listener in this room, have a different effect on the board than chairman who walk in saying, I'll let everybody prattle and then I'll take the decision. And you have both types of chairman. Right. So Gopal, just a quick response from you on uh, this promoted driven companies because a substantial part of the book details the corporate failures in India, Kingfisher or CG Power, Satyam, and all of them are promoter driven companies. So any specific comment from you as to what is the debilitating factor in promoter driven companies? No, I would not, I hope I have not suggested that promoter driven companies have a inbuilt debility. And that is not my intention. If inadvertently has come that way, I clarify. Every company has a founder. Like every human being has a parent. <laughs> right? I don't mind the use of the word founder. I don't mind the use of the word majority shareholder. But this word promoter, you know, language, India is a linguistic culture. You know, you think of Egypt, you think of pharaohs and pyramids, you think of uh, Greeks, you think of pillars and uh, Plato and Aristotle. India is a linguistic culture. In this room, I can bet my bottom dollar, everybody here in this room will be speaking at least two languages, if not three. It may not be perfect, but Hindi, some Kannada, some Tamil, and then English, everybody would be speaking. So we are a linguistic culture. And therefore, the word makes a big difference. And my problem with this is, given that we are a linguistic culture, the idea that we should call it a promoter-driven gives the impression that somehow he's the guy who matters. I have known promoters who... Sorry, I'm using the word because it's in common use. Who say, why do I need independent directors? And therefore, that's the sort of uh, thrust in which I, I don't think there's something wrong with promoter-driven companies. It's people who think that they have exercised full power without accountability to any other person. That's the problem. It may be a promoter. It could happen in a professional company. You know, it could happen in Tata or Hindustan Lever or ICICI or whatever. Uh, Gopal, a substantial part of the book looks at the... Uh, Components of corporate governance, such as the board of directors, the CEO, the independent directors, and so on. So let's take one each one of them quickly so that our friends here will get a perspective on what is it that you're trying to convey there. Speaking of the board of directors, what you have said is that boards do not usually reckon the behavioral aspects. They ignore what you describe as the smoke signals 
And one very unusual word that you have brought out, prodome, which are early signs of governance failure. Would you like to comment on that? Well, I alluded to that in my opening remarks. We've devised a question here because I do believe that a director, howsoever innocent he may be of the nature of the business of that company or the people around, can see or feel that something is not right. And I think I call them early warning signals. Prodrome is a word we've borrowed from medical terminology. A doctor says these are the early signals of diabetes or cancer or whatever. So I've just borrowed that term. And I've given this 15 point question here. And I can bet you your bottom dollar, I'm not promoting the sale of my book, actually I am. <laughs> but do buy the book and see that 15 point questionnaire and apply it to India as you see it today. Apply it to Israel, apply it to China and see whether it works and then apply it to your building society. Just to quote uh, what Gopal has written folks, on page 11 he says, the invisible behavioral aspects of corporate governance inadequate listening skills, disagreements, meaningful participation in strategy or succession planning, interpretation of smoke signals, behavioral oddities and trust building. These merit significant attention. And then he goes on to add that in respect of why board members don't do it, he says the benefit of being accepted is far greater than the benefit of being right or cautious. Hence, behavior often trumps the rules and laws that define the role and duties of the independent director, the board chairman, and the myriad do's and don'ts for them. I thought that was a very eloquent and strong way of putting it. Now, Gopal, uh, coming to uh, more discussion on this board of directors, there is a very elaborate mention made about the biases that prevail among the boards, which lead to deficiencies in the governance structure, such as you know, cognitive bias, group think, and so on. Will you elaborate on that? Well, again, I alluded to that in my opening remarks. So I will not spend too much time on it. Maybe it will be helpful if I took a specific example so that it doesn't sound like uh, 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 something theoretical. Uh, there was a board meeting of Tata Sons. I don't mind saying this because this happened 25 years ago and the people concerned are still alive so I'm not talking behind their back and a subject came up that Tata Sons which is the company of which I was the director had a certain amount of land uh, not land uh, building space uh, in a very prime location those of you who are familiar with Bombay you know Kala Goda is not exactly back of the beyond and that it would be given to Trent which is promoted by Simon and uh, Noel Tata to set up a departmental store. So this goes back 20-25 years. I was a new guy of the block and I was in a dilemma. What was going through my head is, uh, yeah, we've got a piece of uh, real estate which we don't need, we must give it to somebody. But <laughs> he is your brother and she is related to you and how do I know that you're getting the right rupees per square foot. But how do I say it? The person sitting in the chair is Ratan Tata and the people sitting around the table, if you sat on a Tata son's board, it is a good lesson in humility. You know, Nani Palkiwala, Jamshed Baba, you know, the very illustrious bunch of guys and you're the little pipsqueak at the corner. But to my great help, Ratan Tata himself said that this is, in those days, the word related party transaction hadn't been invented. <laughs> he said it would not be appropriate for the board to consider this proposal. He himself has moved the proposal because I don't have any access to competitive courts. How do I know I'm getting the right price? So, I, I mean, I said, whatever my biases, I'm just saved from ignominy. I would have got kicked out of the board if I, I thought I would have got kicked out of the board, though I don't think I would have got kicked out. And the whole matter was deferred. And three months later, they came with all the stuff. And I think it was changed from X to X plus something else. And it's an arm's length transaction. Later on, RTPs and all came in. And I'm giving that as an example to say how the bias works. I'm not giving that as an example of how I broke the bias because this is not about me. 
it's about the board dynamics <clears throat> right so uh, one part of governance has to do with the ceo because the ceo sets the mood and the functioning of the board in many respects and generally the ceo is identified as a heroic figure the person who stands at the deck and is able to take the whole thing forward and you rightly say in your book that the ceo himself should be or herself should be a, an amalgam of achara and vichara that is conduct and intent in addition to competence of course you have also given details about the mantras for ceos uh, would you like to spell them out a little bit because they are i think relevant for this discussion on what we expect from ceos and how their role is in order to prevent uh, corporate failure uh, governance failure and promote good positive governance i won't go into it in any uh, big detail and refer to the book and item number 1 2 3 4 <laughs> but i have tried to reflect see i began my career a long time ago 55 years ago and in my early years and those who are in my sort of age group will relate to this very well the image of a good ceo ceo is a surrogate for promoter chairman whatever you want to call him you know don't take ceo uh, other than to say a powerful person in a powerful position uh, had to have big blue eyes a square jaw Uh, he had to be able to bark out orders he had to have a clarity of mind which is sharper than the shaving razor he used in the morning and uh, he knew the answer to everything and all you had to do was to ask him and he would tell you that was the image harold janin he was a master of wisdom right. later on poor jack welch when he was alive he was a hero then he became a zero but let's not get into that gradually during my 55 years i have found the image of a ceo has changed thanks to uh, people like r r nair who is in this audience who brought in the soft touch to leadership and today the narrative is the ceo admits he doesn't know more than other people the ceo listens more than he talks the ceo reaches out to people here the ceo comes with an open mind which means he doesn't come with the idea that this is the way to fix this problem he says i wonder how to fix this problem then his mind is open and if you come in saying uh, i was just discussing with some other uh, occasion that when i read board papers i have a pen i'm sure many of you do the same thing we mark and then when the like a hockey field when the field opens up a little i'll jump in with that question <laughs> and i'll try to finish all my four but he's got a different four and so on and so forth so you don't get an accretion of wisdom i have shot my four arrows he has shot his four arrows the poor chap has survived eight arrows and you let him off the hook the way that prakash tandon was the chairman when i joined the company i was a little kid obviously but i looked up to him and one day he told me many years later he became a senior friend if i may use that word but when i was a trainee he invited us for lunch and it was a terrifying experience i had just come out of an iit i was accustomed to eating on a steel thali without washing my hands and scooping up large volumes of food and here i was on the fifth floor dining room PDR it was called private dining room the carpet was so thick that i think i sank into it and there were three or four pieces of cutlery on each side and when we started talking there were four of us trainees at some stage prakash tandon leaned over he said young man how many years do you have said, two years and how many mouths do you have <laughs> one what's the surface area of your ears compared to your mouth did some quick algorithms without software two multiplied by twice the surface area four times he said don't you think you should listen four times as much as you speak <laughs> i think it was a wonderful message and i was all of 22 at that time i felt very embarrassed but later on i thought the old man was not wrong and just for the information of our friends across 
you may not have read the book i found that these mantras for ceos actually apply to all not just for the ceos and i'll just repeat the mantras one directors seek effective solutions while executives seek efficient solution second learn to listen third like treat directors as your senior friends fourth directors are fallible get the best out of each one of them five work offline with the alpha arguers and the reticent six elicit views on long term strategy don't wait for the big discussion day and seven do not become larger than what you are and eight this is quintessential gopal before shooting the arrow of your opinion dip it in honey so i strongly recommend this book not as an agent of gopal wanting to sell the book but because of the general learning that is evident in this book gopal another constituent of governance something that has now attracted the public eye and that comes a lot is the role of the independent directors and the law today emphasizes the role as though they are the sentinels of good governance and so on but yet there are conspicuous failures despite having blue ribbon independent directors in companies like satyam kingfisher that has been pointed out in the book and commenting on it you say that they require soft skills they require to be alive to the smoke signals that you mention and equally you have also brought out a mantra for the independent directors i would like you to comment in some detail about the independent directors again i am not going to go to those particular pages and comment in the interest of promoting the book about which i am now quite blase um i want to talk about the you see who is independent once i was in a meeting in sebi and somebody was waxing forth on independent i said are you independent we are all biased the moment you have kitted yourself that you are not a biased person then you got a problem so we must understand there are limits to independence and just like newtonian physics was destroyed by nuclear physics which said that a particle can be in two different places at the same time it is unacceptable in newtonian physics but you niels bohr had made a interpretation of such a statement when schrodinger's cat was brought out by schrodinger he said the opposite of a truth is not an untruth it could be another truth and unless your mindset says there are multiple truths you are living in a binary world ye sahi hai ye sahi nahi hai ye jhoot bolta hai ye sach bolta hai dekhi both of us could be saying the right thing same thing and an independent director therefore should have judgment we hire independent directors for having been a chartered accountant or a mba or a ceo or a ias or whatever but actually one should apply the test of judgment and human judgment there are volumes of books on it i apply the test this is my experience i'm not saying it's the only it's the right answer the judgment is the ability to see two opposite points of view and yet be able to function that is judgment and that's a very rare skill now every independent director cannot be god endowed with judgment but many people have a wrong impression of what is the role of the independent director they say he doesn't know anything about my business i sell billiard balls and he know nothing about billiards but i'm saying the finest independent directors are not necessarily domain specialists especially in technology companies people get fascinated with let's get young fellows who are 32 onto the board and in fact young fellows even sit and tell the finance minister how to run this country but i'm thinking that's a point of view take it in account i'm not against it but an independent director should be taken for judgment and judgment comes out of observing behavioral processes how do you select the candidate to join your company is it through rational methods yes the hr department will give you a docket of papers and that will tell you that this guy studied in st stevens he's a very bright guy 
he went to oxford he became a road scholar you're not going to hire him just for that so you put him through the ragging for 45 minutes ask him some complicated questions and you hired him there's a judgment involved and i do believe that there are lots of people i meet especially those who state that they are aspiring directors and they would like to benefit from my experience i take them seriously i said you're not being hired just because you retired from the other place dash it you got to be able to demonstrate in some way how you exercise judgment the moment you're tasked to do that you have to admit when you went wrong also because the guy who says my judgment is so good i always get it right he's got a bad judgment this is the conundrum which i've tried to explore perhaps to three or four pages nothing that i state will not appeal to you but nothing that i state will tell you what to do about it <laughs> and that's the beauty of human behavior there is no right or wrong but you do it by trial wonderful so one of the powerful sections in the book folks is the rumination about the exercise of power because gopal and his co-author say that power gets into the head just as much it gets into the soul so an important thing to do is how do you temper the exercise of power otherwise leadership narcissism as they put it is rife in boards and across companies and there gopal i'd like you to speak a little bit about what you have drawn from our scriptures of charai veti and also you are mentioning of ikigai in order to promote empathy and kindness and fellow feeling gopal see uh, jaira it's very difficult to teach behavior you can discuss behavior and if you discuss it right you may get a change i know now there's a big coaching industry i don't belong to that but all of us who are operating managers have been coaches and nothing gives us more joy especially if you're past 60 if somebody comes and says to you i worked under you 20 years ago you had an influence on me uh, it's human that you feel good so i think what happens with development of judgment which is related to age and experience to some extent i've seen a lot of people who are past 80 who have lousy judgment and i've seen people who are 35 who are very mature judgment so there's no direct connection between this but uh, that awareness that this too shall pass charayavati is from the rigveda ye bhi chalta hai dusra kuch aane wala hai that feeling that you are the hero in that magical moment when you decided to buy that company or to promote the next ceo or to blow a whistle that has to be tempered that i am a player on the stage i have been given the opportunity for that 20 seconds or 15 minutes to give the peroration but that doesn't mean i am the play and that's what i meant over there when i referred to it question can arise you don't need a lecture on power and its pernicious effects either we have suffered it or we have perpetrated it there's not a single guy in this room who can say he has not been a user of power or a victim of power most of us like to present ourselves as the victims but uh, our subordinates will tell us <laughs> how we misused it i have found two methods and i'm being practical one is this clementine mirror you must have somebody around you who can speak truth to power okay i have had the experience of my wife it could be your brother your sister it could be anybody somebody who says you know i think you should rethink this one you may have a little squabble for some time but you start thinking about it i believe spouses can play a very important role uh, i use the word spouse advisedly because women can also be tough ceos so the reverse also holds but there's a second thing that i have i have stumbled upon and i said why didn't i think of this before and that is when swami vivekananda went to chicago in 1893 
he was addressing a largely american audience he met john d rockefeller and asked him a question i love telling stories as you can see but i think it illustrates the point better than giving a gyan he said mr rockefeller how much richer than the average american are you he said do oh, i don't know i may be a thousand times richer he said okay let's accept that are you a thousand times smarter than the average american and rockefeller's reply was this all recorded and written huh? by it's available in if you go to vivekananda or ramkrishna mission you can buy this he said i must be he said has it ever occurred to you that you are merely a conduit for this wealth and he said what not so this fellow talking but sure enough i won't go through all the intermediate steps in 1912 i think it was he endowed the rockefeller foundation and there isn't a rockefeller business anymore but there's lots of wonderful work done by the rockefeller foundation now i'm giving you this back story to go back to swami vivekananda he was asked by an american audience uh, what are the principles of good conduct and business and what was swami ji said Uh, was a very modern version of vedanta he says in my country we talk of vedanta if i tell you the vedanta in sanskrit it is not going to make much sense but let me isolate four principles which if you follow in your business in your he talked of business because he was in america at that time new york and chicago boston he said here are the four principles and you listen to it and you say bravo how simple how tough what are the four principles he said first and i'll let me try to remember these four principles he said serve others before you serve yourself you talk to founders entrepreneurs you or any other corporate executive for that matter you do see signs of how power makes them serve themselves before they serve others so that's one the second thing he said is protect and nurture the resources that enable you to do whatever you're doing so the employees who work for you the community which allows you to do that work the air and the water that enable you to do what you're doing protect it that's the second thing he said the third thing he said is take your decisions ruthlessly but implement them with compassion you don't have to implement it ruthlessly try to think of this difference and there's a fourth one which is probably in the book but i'm trying to say to you uh, in a summary that power will go to people's heads you can't wish it away there's no point writing a book about how to defuse the power bomb in our heads all of us are victims of it but i found these two the clementine mirror and the vedanta to be extremely valuable in guiding me when i was going out of line and i have gone out of line well gopal knowing you uh, rather well for over three decades and when i read your book intently i thought to myself that in a way this book maps your personal transformation from that of being a rookie trainee in hindustan lever to the great heights that you have achieved in the corporate world in leadership and in other positions so is this book mapping your personal journey and if so i have something to substantiate you speak about how you image is different from you real i can quote that particular aspect you also speak about what a wise director should do about the power of obliquity and finally you have spoken about it yourself the fly on the wall speaking about uh, uh you image you say non executive director should be at a life stage when their thinking is dominated more by you real rather than you image they should be dependable both ethically and professionally then you go on to add that in respect of judgment good judgment emanating from managerial experience active listening and welcoming diverse viewpoints can curb corporate 
misgovernance, transgressions. And finally, and then I'd like you to comment, your formula for a wise director is you real plus managerial experience plus active listening plus welcoming diverse viewpoints. These put together make a wise director. Does that describe your transformation today, Gopal? Uh, I think I cannot talk about myself. Uh, I didn't read it as my personal journey. And who the hell cares about my journey? We are all there for a short while and then we are move on and there are other people to take the stage. So I never saw it. I, I'm sure I have transformed. Show me a person in this room who has not transformed over the years. Uh, to that extent, yes. But that was never in my in my mind as I wrote the book, but where I've narrated personal experiences, obviously I'm suggesting that that had some impact on me. But the point is this, that uh, especially if you're at a very senior level, your CEO, director of some company, uh, this feeling that you forget your you real, you become the you me, you become the karta of that particular decision. The media, the writing, the books promote that idea. In that magical moment, on that morning, at 8 o'clock, so-and-so got this brilliant idea and the whole world changed after that. Steve Jobs made an apple. And this is journalism. Nothing wrong with it. I also do some writing. Mm -hmm. You always have to go back to, who am I? And I want to, again, give one small example. All of these are not necessarily in the book. But when we are young, we work with people who are not famous necessarily. They might have become famous. But some episode touched you. And I would like to touch the... Uh, at one stage of my career, I was the marketing manager for a dairy in ETA in UP. Okay, and my boss was a wonderful gentleman. God bless his soul, he's gone now, Bipin Shah, who was a good... And I'm saying this in a positive way. Don't get me wrong if there's a Gujarati here. He's a good Gujarati Baniya brain. You know, I mean, he knew commerce. With He was a chartered accountant, but that's incidental. I'm saying he had a good trading brain. And we had done certain things in our business. And we got the sales force together. And I was a marketing manager. So I thought it was upon me to give them the clarion call. Um... And I did what I did, like a good young marketing fellow. There were slides, presentations, ra ra ra, audio visuals, music. And when we finished all that, the salesmen were very good, and they said, "Saab, apni acha baat kia." Then Bipin Shah was invited to speak, and he just got up and said, "I'm not a great speaker. I happen to be running this business now." And I'm intrigued that this wonderful company, Hindustan Lever, has set up this and has not been able to make a profit and has lost money for 10 years. I have nothing to tell you because what we have done to the products and the factories and the brands has all been explained to you. I just want to tell you one thing. I want you to know that there are 250 people working in this factory, each of whom has a family of five people. And there are milk suppliers and other people. So the ecosystem of this factory is 6,000 people. If you can just sell another kilo or another two at the end of the day when you're tired, it will help to save 6,000 jobs. And I tell you, the guys were eating out of his hand. Oh, they said, is that all that's required? That we must be able to sell two kilos more at the end of a tiring day. And you do the maths. And actually, I'm not saying that's the only thing that worked. But this is what I mean by saying wisdom. You can make presentations to the head. But talking to the heart is a different art. And that's why we've written that about wisdom. Excellent. And before we move to Q&A, uh, in the book, you know, Gopal makes laudatory references to his association and the board management of Tatars and Hindustan Unilever. And I thought it was inspiring to end on the lines of J.R.D. Tata when he said, quote, corporate enterprises must be managed not merely in the interests of their owners, but equally in those of their employees, of the consumers, of their products, of the local community, and finally, 
of the country as a whole. I think this is an extraordinary testament to what good governance should be in the company. And with, I'd like you to comment on that before we start the Q&A. No, I, I don't have a comment, but since you said JRD, I, know, I didn't know JRD personally. I have not worked with him. But if you're sitting in Bombay House, you can't help but be enveloped with stories. And I want to mention a small little story, which relates to the point you made, but also to the previous point about the you real and the you me. It seems J.R.D. Tata was very fond of this pens. It's a passion I also share with him. And he had a very expensive pen. I don't know whichever brand it was. Uh, a fountain pen and a ball pen. They were matched. One day he came to the lunch room, the director's lunch room, looking very hassled. And mentioned that the cause for his being hassled was that he had lost one of the two partners. Naturally, the whole of Bombay House got into the act without being requested to do so. And after every carpet had been turned upside down and the roofs had been ripped apart, the pen, pen was not found. So one colleague, I can mention his name because he's also written a book which has just come out, Jamshed Irani, Dr. Steel is the name of his book, uh, said his chairman is so upset that he's lost his valuable pen, it means something to him. Next trip he went to London, a few weeks later, he went and somewhere near Selfridges on Oxford Street, he found an identical pen. He said, it's so many pounds. He bought it, he came back and he presented it to JRD. And said, sir, this will make you happy. And he has described that JRD took it, looked at it. He says, Jamshed, you're right. This is absolute replica of what I had. And it's so wonderful that you thought about it. That you thought of my pain of losing the pen. Uh, but thank you very much, I can't accept it. He said, why sir? I brought it of my own will, you didn't ask me to buy it. He said, I can't accept it because if I accept a gift from you, don't get me wrong, it's nothing to do with you, I'll have to accept gifts from other people also who work with me. And the competition will start about who's given me the better gift. <laughs> I don't want Tata's to go down that way. So if you don't mind, Please accept my appreciation for your thought. Now, this is what I call empathy. And that this story has remained in Jamshed's head. And just before he passed away, he dictated this story and it's been published. Tells you what empathy is all about. Uh, thank you, Gopal. Uh, I think we now have some... Time for Q&A. How should we do it? Does, do people just get up? Uh, and talk yes, you can put your hand up and we'll get you with the mic. Yes, sir. You, and by the way, if you don't mind, just a question, okay? Sure. You can introduce yourself yeah. and then ask the question. Yeah. My name is uh, Siddharth Pandaram. And the question I have is... Um, Use the mic. Yeah. Uh, the question I have is, um, you know, we've seen an unraveling of a lot of venture-backed companies in the last couple of years. Is the venture model itself, the economics of the venture model, so tenuous that it actually leads to a different set of outcomes for boards compared to non-venture-backed companies, public or private? Uh, I'm going to give you a general answer because your question is also a general one. Uh, I don't think there's something, you know, we are very fond of finding the venture model or this model or that model wrong. It's how the model is used that is the problem and not the model itself. Artificial intelligence may be the new thing, new kid around the block. It's how you use it. When I began my career, I started as a programmer and a coder and a systems analyst. And people were terrified that computers will destroy everybody. It has not happened. In fact, you can't do without your computer now or your cell phone. So I don't believe it's the model. It is to do with the entrepreneur and the philosophy he brings to his business. I'm not here to judge other people. But I don't believe it's the venture model that is wrong. Venture. India is very fortunate to have a, a huge amount of chaotic kinetic energy amongst young people. And the question is whether systems can be designed to use that. Some people use it well, some people don't. Uh, but when a venture model is being used badly, it's fine for you to take. After all, let's face it, we are sitting in the city of Bangalore. If I go back to say 1975 to 1990 period, 
who are the startups the sexy startups tcs infosys airtel hdfc biocon they were also startups so my brother and i i love partnering with other people to write books because he wrote, wrote a book called wisdom for startups from grown ups and we enjoyed writing that book because there's always something a child can learn from a parent but don't learn everything your parent learned because that's also not productive okay uh with your permission gopal can i recognize mr and mrs raghavan your elder brother who fortunately opted to be a city, uh, resident of bangalore unlike gopal <laughs> mr raghavan thank you for being here and mrs raghavan any other question please any other well if you don't have a question and if you are still thinking about a question i'd like to ask gopal something that has been on my mind at the last part of the book you say gopal what should boards do and incidentally folks i liked very much gopal's description of what a board is it is it is a map and it is a compass and because i am a somewhat late entrant as independent director being a member of some boards for the last decade i thought that what he said about board functions in the future namely sustainability play the long course play the long game and uh, things like that are particularly relevant and i'd like gopal to amplify a little bit about now in the 21st century how should boards navigate their terrain so you know there are independent directors and dependent directors if i may use the word uh, inappropriately the operating directors of the company or the promoter family or whatever you want to call it they are designing maps for the company to move forward now what's the definition of a map you try to chart out with precision what are the various phases of the journey how you would recognize that you're on the right journey see your petrol pump on the left a mcdonald's on the right then you know you're on the right path that's a map independent directors don't have domain knowledge necessarily some of them may have uh, they look at a compass ki bhai is it going about the right direction right that's what i meant by the niyat part and the niti part so if you can have a combination remember the history of navigation until 1100 or 1200 until somebody in portugal produced a map making skills navigational skills in the ocean everybody relied on a compass bhai mota moti yahan jana hai vasco da gama set off for america but he ended up in india um we need a map and a compass and in the board there must be people who can say this is going in the right direction hold back i want to give again an example i think they're all in the book uh, as far as i'm aware as far as i can recall um, i was a vice chairman of tata chemicals ratan tata was the chairman and a proposal came up which said for long this company has been looking for a natural source of this particular material it's called sodium carbonate or soda ash we have always done it synthetically by pumping out sea water and progressing it this will, in a world where energy is becoming very expensive this will be a good way for us to go we have been invited by the government of uh, tanzania to which has deposits of natural sodium ash to take lake natron and develop it as a mine mine resource it is wildly attractive because without spending that kind of energy you would get soda ash and soda ash goes into this glass this bottle uh, many applications so we said that sounds terrific accept it the management went ahead and as you know when you're doing a project like that there are a number of steps environmental clearance feasibility study detailed feasibility report i think we had spent 10 or 15 million dollars which is a fair amount of money if you go back 20 years and uh, think of the size of tata chemicals in those days suddenly we get a message 
saying, you know, you're putting up, you're thinking of putting up a plant in that place. That's the nesting site of the little flamingo. <laughs> a little flamingo. What's a big flamingo? What's a medium flamingo? We were that innocent. Well, we said, if somebody's telling us, let's do something about it. And you can imagine the activity that went on. And to cut a long story short, we did find that in the path from uh, last tip of South America to Siberia, the little flamingo did nest there. And we had no clue that it was nesting there. We had no clue what would be the effect of a plant in the place where it would nest. And if something happened to the little flamingo, what, the number of species that are gone extinct will go from 7.8 million to 7.81 million. Uh, so what? You can imagine, 15 million dollars, quarterly results to be announced. 15 million dollars as a project may not look very large, but if you multiply it by rupees and say in this quarter we have to take a hit on it, it causes a dilemma. Your short term dictates that do something, you will tell the accountant, please find a way to sort of dodge this one. The accountant said, sorry sir, you're asking me the rules. The rules are that if you're canning the project, you take the hit. I'm not concerned with what you tell. He didn't say it that way. He said, you figure out what to do with the invest. And we took the hit. We reported a loss that quarter, or a loss or a very marginal profit. And I want to tell you the sense of the board at that time was we can't set this company on a course or a map where the compass is pointing in the wrong direction. That's how I got the inspiration for the compass and the map. Because once you've done that, you, you just go off in the wrong direction. So while ESG may look like some fancy idea of uh, some uh, restless NGOs, it's real and it is possible to factor it in and sometimes it hurts but is it better to get hurt today so that you're not cursed after 20 years or 50 years is a question that devs have to wrestle with excellent in fact that's in the book about sustainability and your example uh, i'm very happy here that our esteemed uh, senior colleague, Mr. Nair, is here. Nair Saab was a doyen of our corporate world. And sir, would you like to say anything? Give him the mic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jairaj and uh, Gopal. This is really fascinating. I haven't bought this here. I ordered a copy and read it. Going back in time, um, I remember late Professor Bala Subramaniam of IIM Bangalore uh, and I, we were serving Union Bank as an independent director and in a very amusing way he made an expression, we are all dependently independent and I thought it's a very perceptive comment going forward. But one of the things we found it extremely useful was the independent director's own uh, gathering. Own? Own gathering. Yeah. Gathering. 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 Yeah. In the sense that uh, things which are not discussed in the board meeting, our perspectives, and how do we strategize and make effective contribution. I think I'm going back in time, even before it became part of the guidelines, I found it to be extremely useful. But that's the side. In your book, one thing that you talked about is the need to have healthy skepticism on the part of an independent director. You also went on to say that the independent director must also be able must be? to yes. must be able to hold top leadership in terms of four dimensions. And I really liked it and probably you may like to amplify. One is credibility. And number two is reliability. Number three is intimacy. And number four is perception, preoccupation with oneself. And I think that's the explanation. And I think when I really look at all these, and then really look at 
How does independent directors function in organizations where the CEO has had a very, very long innings and is an extremely established, well-reputed leader? Take, for example, Deepak Parekh or A.M. Nayaks of the world or uh, Uday Kotek himself, a founder. Now, how does an independent director navigate and influence and impact in such a context is one question, and the last one, which you may like to comment, is that there are many aspirants who want to become an independent director in company boards, who attend a number of programs which are meant to prepare people to become independent directors. Because in most companies, and a couple of private companies that I've served, and even now I am serving, the CEO, a couple of significant members used to have bit of a due, due diligent type of a conversation in order to actually check out whether this person will be a good fit culturally and whether the person has got a perspective which is independent to express and communicate. And what is therefore the role of organizations which are offering preparatory developmental programs for future directors? Are there influences that you could make? This book is illustrative of many, many ideas for such an event. Thank you, sir. Uh, would you like to respond? No, about in the interest of time, I'll... Preparation of independent director. I'll be very brief. How the second one, about... I have... I don't mind using the word. I have been on a campaign in my own small way to people who teach directorship courses, corporate governance courses, saying if you talk of one side of the moon without referring to the other side, your training is incomplete. Just like in management training, if you go back 50 years, 70 years, you taught them the tools of productivity and efficiency, but never taught them the tools of human behavior until the movement began. Saying this, and people like us and Vikram here and Pranab, we were fortunate to be able to get that benefit. Nobody was listening to me because either I wasn't clear enough or they didn't know what to do with the idea. But once this book has come out, the Institute of Directors has made me a mandatory part of their program. So all I'm getting is a lot of lectures, uh, invitations. But I think it's a much wider issue than just corporate boards. So that's the second part. I would like ideally to see a movement. I'm not the sole wisdom on behavior, for God's sake. I mean, there are enough people in this room with wisdom on behavior. I'd like to see this movement uh, over a period of time. Your first question, I don't know if it was... was you know, how, do you, how, does, how do you navigate as independent... Ah, when a long tenure. You see... Fantastic CEOs. Uh, our uh, universe is... Uh, marvelous in the sense that no truth is absolute. Tatvamasi. <laughs> so everybody with a long tenure is not a bad guy. Everybody with a short tenure, you make broad rules to make life simple. And we use algorithms in our mind. My algorithm, based on my experience, which I'm not recommending as the only way to do it, is less than five years for a CEO he takes some time to get into the more than 10 years worry more than 15 worry desperately Correct. now you can point out to me person A or person B who is an exception but for that I can point out person C and D yeah. who are absolutely the rule so I think an independent director who feels just like we all don't age the same way everybody who is 60 is not some people are fit and some people have a lot of problems so you can't make a rule that everybody's past 60 must have his head chopped off that that cannot be the way so i believe that one of the judgments that independent directors have to exercise because your question is about independent is is the asymptote now turning and that doesn't happen with one meeting I can tell you I am on a board of another institution which is not a corporate institution. And uh, I remember asking so and so has been a wonderful head of that institution but it seems to me that there is some leveling off without in any way taking away the credit of what she had done for that institution for such a long time. It took us about 4-5 years. We made the change. 
I'm not saying I made the change. I'm just saying the, the thought comes to your mind. You can do something with it. It may take a bit of time. Okay, uh, Mr. Raghavan, please. Thank you, Gopal. Uh, it's been a wonderful morning. I'm speaking on behalf of not just the entire audience, but myself as well. Uh, wonderful morning, uh, taking time off to come for this uh, function. I'm hearing you after many years uh, because I've been out of Bangalore when you were presenting your books and so on and so forth. Francis Bacon, the English philosopher, said, reading maketh a full man, conversation a ready man, Right. And writing an exact man. <laughs> I, I guess to some extent the art of being exact also envelops the art of being inexact. I will not ask you awkward questions like, should directors be informed of the co contribution to political parties? <laughs> but uh, it's been a great morning. And uh, wish you more with your 19th book and thereafter. Good. So, uh, thank you for that. Since our father is not alive, you're the eldest in the family. Yeah, I yeah. appreciate that very much. You know, folks, I echo what Mr. Raghavan has said. Uh, for me, reading this book and digesting the central messages that Gopal and his co-author have written have been really good learning experiences because, you know, they bring out a gamut of things relating to governance, relating to human behavior, relating to how things can go wrong, and more importantly, how they can be avoided with uh, forethought and with recognizing, as he says, the smoke signals. So, on behalf of all of us, I would like to extend sincere thanks to Gopal and can we give him a round of applause?